works. There it goes. I want to do, um, I have a seminary degree, so I look at everything, I try to look at everything biblically speaking. Um, so home-based therapy, I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, it's simply therapy that happens at home. It has different modalities, it has different techniques. Um, there's about a hundred different ways you can do it. Uh, and some are evidence-based and some are not, and some need to be evidence-based and aren't already. And that's really what we did with this study. We tried to give back, wrap around some, some clout. Uh, or we wanted to see if it could have clout, I should say. Uh, let's, let's, but I want to look at the Christian responsibility in working with home-based uh, clients or the highest at risk or the most vulnerable um, which is interesting giving our culture climate and everybody throwing stones right now um, how this looks. So I'm going to step back here and read it and then I want to break it down and then we'll get into the actual study. Uh, Philippians 2 you may be familiar with. Therefore if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfish ambition. I'm, I'm reading a different uh, uh, version than I have in my head, okay? Or, or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves, but do not merely look out, of your, look out for your own interests or personal interests, see I'm doing it again, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality some with God, I think, to be grasped. Uh, next part. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made, made made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then just a little bit more here. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as my, in my presence only, but now much more than in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. One more. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will provo prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among who you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to be glory. I did not run in vain nor toil in, toil in vain, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. And so it's relevant to home-based therapy. I break it down verse by verse. I heard of exegetical preaching or exegetical study. This is what they do. So verse 1, be of the same mind and have the same purpose. And usually in, the, in biblical passages, the, uh, the, when they say something like this, or they say, therefore, you know the, the point is coming. Okay, so the purpose is serve others in humility, look out for the interests of others, take on Christ's attitude, empty yourself and become a servant. And then keep going. Humble yourself and serve others so that Christ may be glorified. So then obey by working out your salvation with fear and trembling, which has a lot of connotations we don't have time for. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This will make you above, above reproach in a crooked world. And then hold fast to scriptures that show your work is not in vain. When I look at this, and uh, with my experience, and, and I've been reading a lot of David Platt. Anybody read David Platt? No? You're laughing. Do you know him? <laughs> yeah, he's good stuff. There's a book called Radical. And the idea of the way the church is supposed to approach people and how we're supposed to treat people and the government wouldn't have to have a role in taking care of the poor if the church did its job. And so I look at this and I consider it and I think it through and I think, boy, it matches really well with the idea of doing home-based therapy and doing it well and the point of the study. And, and so there's a call for radical service. It's countercultural. It doesn't make any sense. You live below what you make, you give it to the poor. You serve people. There was, a, there was a homeless pregnant lady on the street the other day holding up a sign that said homeless and pregnant, please help. 
And I wanted to go back so bad, but I had both my little girls and I couldn't do anything about it at that time. But I'm going to go find her here later this weekend and try to give her some stuff. Okay, it's beyond our natural inclination. On my own, I don't think I would have those kind of thoughts and feelings. Okay, she's not that different from all the people that I've served in home base. And so one way that Christian counselors and social workers can work that out is by doing home base work and doing it well. It's underpaid, they're underserved, the resources aren't all there, and frankly, most people are burnt out. Okay, so let's, let's give you some frame to the study now. It's important, home base is important for the family um, because it's intensive. It helps take care of multiple problems at once. They can have more than one therapist at once. Uh, and it occurs in life. They do it at the school, they do it at the home, they do it at a community center, they do it at McDonald's. I've done tons, tons of therapy and meetings at a McDonald's. Just quietly, with the client's permission, of course. Because <laughs> otherwise you have some confidentiality problems, right? Um, it's more effective than outpatient in the sense that when there is too intense for outpatient clients are their situation, their problem, the chaotic lifestyle, when it's too intense for outpatient, home-based works. It doesn't work every time, but it works a decent percentage of the time when you have a good therapist. Okay? Uh, and then case management is often given at the same time. For the therapist, it's good experience. Uh, you see everything. They can't hide anything from you. When you're sitting in your outpatient couch, they can tell you what they want you to hear. It's like a politician. They can tell you half of the story and hope you never find out about the rest. Okay? The experience is broad. You meet everybody in every situation. I've had uh, feces on the wall, cockroaches uh, crawling across my shoes, really dirty, gross couches. The smell of bacon grease and cigarette smoke is ingrained in my mind as the smell of poverty. Okay? So here, uh, within our study, here's how the referral process went. So if people went, what, what we did was we looked at wraparound multisystemic therapy, and I'll define those here in just a minute, and the general home-based therapy, which can be all the therapy you do in outpatient when you do it at home, okay? And so people would come into the referral process like this, and this is how they got into the study. Uh, the, the, these are the services and how they get referred one to the next. So, um, the family process there, we tried to take care of it on our own. The school tries to intervene. They possibly re refer them to outpatient therapy. Uh, and if outpatient therapy isn't intensive enough, they get home-based therapy. And then if home-based therapy can't hold it, they get put in a residential treatment facility, which doesn't happen as much as it used to, thank the Lord. Okay, so here's the study. Let's break down the study. Uh, what we knew is that wraparound seemed pretty effective, especially when the uh, um, therapist was motivated. In Calhoun County, where this happened, you have to have a master's degree, you have to have a license. In some counties, you don't have to. Okay? Uh, but we knew that little research compared wraparound with other services. As a matter of fact, little research tested wraparound on its own in comparison with the model. You know how you test according to its model. MST, multisystemic therapy, has a model. Um, PMTO, parent management, parent management Training Oregon model, has a model, uh, and they all try to see how close you adhere to it. So, uh, Wraparound has some of that as well. And then uh, we figured and we found in the literature, everybody said that Wraparound had more steps they had to go before they could be considered evidence-based, which means they have a years of research and enough research that it shows it to be effective consistently. Okay? And so we wanted to add to that research base. All right. So here are the definitions for wraparound multisystemic therapy and general home-based. Wraparound, like I said, it's a community-based treatment. It's a little less treatment as far as therapy treatment as it is. You're the social worker or you're the case manager and the therapist at the same time. Okay, and oftentimes there's another therapist as well. All right. Then multisystemic therapy is an intensive home base, but it's run through the court system typically. You have to have a legal record or be close to having a legal record or be on probation or be under warning of probation to even be entered into multisystemic therapy. It's specific for offenders. Okay, So they have it across the state. I know they have it some across the country. It's based out of South Carolina. It's got about 30 years of extensive research behind it. It's really effective with that particular population. General home-based therapy is just counseling in the home. It is, you can do Adelirian, you can do CBT, you can do DBT, and oftentimes they do all three. 
Uh, you can do many of them, and it can last for several years. It can last for two months. It just depends. So here was our purpose specifically, to compare Wraparound's effectiveness with two other home-based services so as, to, so as to add to its research base. Okay, and then there were calls in the literature, there were Burns and others in 2000. They wanted, to, they wanted more people to look at it because they thought it was, had enough weight that it should be considered. So then our rationale for this study. Um, community mental Ill health agencies, years ago, I think it may have been 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago by now, they used to have way more kids in residential facilities. If you, they didn't think you could make it to the community at all, they just shipped you off. Right? And when I first came into the community mental health in Calhoun County, they were starting to, or actually they were in the final stages of pulling all those kids out of the, out of the residential treatment programs because they found out it was too expensive. Those kids were getting institutionalized and they were getting worse because they were learning from each other. And so they thought if we could um, support kids in community, they had better results, and it saved them a lot of money. Because what are residential facilities, like a grand a day? It's, it's wild. Okay, so, and then outcomes and opinions are mixed, Dell, and there needed to be some more clarity within the research. So we're trying to do that. So we did a quantitative, quasi-experimental design. Uh, we had three different groups. They got the three different treatments, and we used the CAFIS which is on the next slide, I'll, we'll talk about that more, as a dependent variable. It's the Child Adolescent Functioning Assessment Scale. It's got eight categories, and it looks at the child's functioning in several areas. Okay, and so we collected some demographic information. It was archival data, so it was already there. They gave it to me, I used it, okay? And then it was pre-test, post-test, because you would get the CAFIS when you started, three and six months in, and then at the end. So we used the pre and the post. So here's the CAFIS. It's got these eight areas that are in different font for some reason. School, work, home, community, behavior towards others, moods, emotions, self-harmful behavior, substance abuse, and thinking. The only thing it never really seemed to measure was the spirituality, which is, you may be aware, the community mental health is, though they say it, they, the opposite. They're relatively opposed to that in session. Okay. Demographic questionnaire uh, was administered by the wraparound program at the beginning. So we used those. We couldn't get everything because some of it wasn't entered correctly, but uh, by the people who collected it in the first place. But uh, we got some stuff. So we had 291 participants. We started with 370, but had to throw some of them out. They were all between the ages of 5 and 17, collected between 2007 and 2012. Those were the years I was there. Uh, they had the dem demographic questionnaires, like I said, and the CAFIS. So those, those were our data points. And then here's what we found. Um, I'm sorry, this is a demographic information. That's not what we found. <laughs> so the educational setting, most of them were in elementary school. We had a few in middle school and high school. Okay, but most of them were in that kind of five through seven age, uh, not age, but grade range. Okay. Uh, they were either on probation or they weren't. It was about half and half just because we had MST in there, and then some of the wraparound folks were on that as well. Okay. We looked at age. Now here's, the, here's what we found. That's where we're going. Okay. So what we did find, what was, the, what was the interesting thing is MST people, we're sending this off to publish here pretty soon. It's in its last stages of editing. I sent it off to my, one of my old PhD professors, and she's looking it over one last time. But what we found that was the most interesting thing was multisystemic therapy has a lot of money behind it. And it's really expensive because you get one therapist for about six clients, right? And that's their full-time job. So you're paying somebody 40 grand a year to see six people. It's part of the model. And then home-based therapy, they can have anywhere from 10 to 15 people on their caseload. It just depends on how what the load is for that individual person. And wraparound, you're supposed to have 12, but we had 30 because <laughs> we were overwhelmed. And what we found was that MST wasn't any more effective than the rest of them. And specifically, their population was so narrow that they weren't as broad based. They weren't as broad based, and they weren't as um, serviceable to a community, if you will. You have to sp fit a specific mold. And in home based and in wraparound, the mold is much broader. And so, financially speaking, for community mental health, it makes a lot more sense if you look at this as the gospel, which I wouldn't do entirely, 
uh, it makes a lot of sense to get rid of MST and just have these services serve everybody else. Now, the MST people, T people don't like it because they've got 30 years of research that says they're effective, but they don't ever show you who they're effective with. And they don't ever show you, like, are they not effective with the rest of the world, <laughs> right? You can tell therapy is really good if it's broad, right? CBT, one of the big draws for CBT is it can be worked to several different kinds of people. If you're on a diet, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, it doesn't really matter. CBT could work, okay? Um, and one of the problems we had, we could have done some more depth of study, what we had is they didn't start at the same place. They started at different services or they had other services before they came into this and they had different starting points. So it was really hard to compare them over overall. So we couldn't look at uh, with, uh, within groups, we had to look at between groups, if that makes any sense. So. Um, I talked about this. So, th no, here's a point. Th that's that third one down. Uh, MST and Rapiron, when they were combined and their severity level of client was the same, they had equal effectiveness. As a matter of fact, Rapiron, I think, was more effective, if I remember correctly. But if you look at it as um, they were, if you had different levels of intensity, like if their calf has started higher, which the higher it is, the lower level of functioning they have. If it started higher, they would uh, they would actually do better in wraparound than they would in MST. It was really interesting. Okay, so so the the, the the moral of the story is what I'm trying to get at is basically they're all kind of the same in their effectiveness, and a lot of it has to do with the therapist as well. Okay. Well, we did find some other side things you might find interesting. Adolescents consistently had higher scores, which makes sense at their if you look at that second spot, uh, youth are in that identity versus um, identity confusion stage, right? They have an identity for crisis around the teenage years, and so it would make sense that their level of functioning would not be as well or as good as a seven-year-old who's still white and black or um, no gray area in life. You know, he's not questioning anything. He's just having fun. Uh, so it can be said that adolescents are more likely to have identity confusion and thus worse scores on the CAFAs. All right. uh, we also looked at probation status, and it just makes sense because one of the categories is legal on the CAFAs, and so they scored higher in the CAFAs when they had a probation status on their record, or they were on probation, I should say, or they had been on probation recently, and so that made it higher. And so it made sense, right? So. Um, one of the problems with the CAFIS, let me talk about that. The, the CAFIS has a lot of data that, data that says it has no inner rater reliability problems, which is the difference between one rater rating a scale and the other one rating it and the differences, right? Because there's a lot of uh, opinion in those and how you perceive things that the clients tell you and what they tell you. But they say they don't have any trouble with that. And what I found was there was a kind of a struggle with that between therapists. Even in the practice of it when we were doing it, I'd do a CAFIS or somebody, the next person would do it, we'd be about 10, 20 points off. It's a problem when they're identifying for services, you know, you have to have an 80 to get into more intensive services, which is like an average of between 10 and 20 in each category which means you have a lower level of functioning. Because 30 is the worst. It means you're, you're not functioning well at all. 20 is I'm not functioning well. 10 is I'm doing okay. And zero is you're doing better than everybody else. Like me, they're doing better than me. And so uh, with the CAFIS, we, we really struggled um, because the research said one thing, but our experience said another, if that makes any sense. So I think I went way too fast. What time is it? <laughs> Yeah, I went like 25 minutes is all. Because this is really the end. I mean, this is what we did. I thought I was going to go longer, but all right. So these are recommendations for future research. Frankly, we did it. It worked. Uh, it showed calf the wraparound is reliable. And it showed all the, not reliable, but is effective. And it showed the other services is effective as well. But certainly one study is not enough to show um, the world that wraparound should be implemented in more places, right? And so we should look at wraparound's model adherence. There is, a, there is a scale for that, meaning how well did you actually do wraparound or were you doing something else? 
Uh, there is a scale for that, but it's not well appreciated, if you will. And it's not widely used. I can tell you what we did in Calhoun County wasn't always wraparound. It was just get it done. Mm, you've got 30 clients. Because uh, in other counties, they were meeting with people two and three times a week. And we would meet with them once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Okay. And so that was a problem for us as well. Uh, I'd like to look at probation's impact on CAFIS more if, if the probation didn't mark it up on its own. I want to see in other areas of functioning uh, if, the, if the other areas go up as far as their scores go up because their functioning is lower because of probation status. Because probation by itself knocks it up, I want to see if the other ones have step up on their own just to see what the correlations are. Okay. So here are implications. All right. Because of the broader service group and availability, uh, it seems like wraparound and home-based services should be considered more beneficial. Okay, that's the big concluding thought. If a county were considering implementation and they asked me my opinion, I would say I'd do MST last. If you still have the money, do it last. Okay, that's gonna make some people upset. And then there's the implications for Christian counselors in these situations in service and what it looks like. And are there differences between somebody who's committed to their faith and really wants to serve people and somebody who wants to serve people but isn't, doesn't have any faith to speak of or any relationship to a church or anything like that? Be interesting to see if there's a difference. Because motivation can change. So that's it. There's only four of us. Yeah. So if you have any questions, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for knowing I've seen it so much better. You read it too, didn't you? Yeah, well, you had me looking at uh, yeah, that's right I did. I've seen it more when you speak it because imagine that. But so my question is, you had said in the other county you need to drive around and they were more successful because they had a smaller client. Well, I don't know if they were more successful, but they had a smaller client base. But they were successful. Yeah, well, yeah, I would say just as. Okay, so I guess that leads to my question then. Could there be a comparison between, between the county? Between what happened in Calhoun County, which if you had a large client base and you only had a client that came every couple of weeks, and then another county that had success because they saw the clients every week. So, number one, does it make a difference? And number two, the clients and groups that are faster mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, I, I kind of doubt I could get Calhoun County to go in on that because they didn't want the state to know what they were doing. Because <laughs> they, they sh if the state would have known, they would have said, stop it. Why? Because they weren't adhering to the model, and they were getting state money. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they do that anymore. The person who was doing that uh, is no longer there. Right. So, I mean, it makes you know, but could you have private faith based organizations do that for us? Yeah. I don't know why. I mean, the funding source might have to be different, but I don't see why they couldn't. Right. Because yeah. it would be interesting if there was one doing that and studying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, aside from learning the therapy and wraparound's not, not that hard to learn. It's like, go in there and get your pants dirty, you know. Because I always like to say, get your pants dirty. People talk about getting your hands dirty. You have to get your pants dirty. You sit on their couch, sit on their chairs, rub up against their walls. Their dog gets all over you. You have to get their pants, your pants dirty, you know? or else you don't understand. So, and keep, uh, I always tell students, keep uh, Lysol and lice spray and running shoes and a first aid kit, always with you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I've got a pair of brown shoes that are dressy and they can run in and that's what I always wore. And that don't have like big grips because you don't want to pick up stuff. <laughs> you can carry lice out of the house, bed bugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So yeah, um, this is yeah. This I I did this to finish my to finish my PhD partially because the data was there. I love I love home based work in the in what it does. I just don't love how it is in a lot of ways. It's just it's not well done in a lot of places. And so my real research interests are more are changing. And so we're actually doing a study right now. We started it. I got my old stats professor and my buddy from Seattle for my PhD, and we're working on it together. We're looking at um, uh, mood status and uh, an understanding of one's own theology. So your level of theology, understanding, like basic Christian theology, and how it affects your emotional status. So we got, yeah, we got permission to use the state of theology survey from anybody here, Legionnaire Ministries, R.C. Spohl, Ravi Zacharias, they're all part of it. Yeah, and um, actually I brought the Platt book too. At Caps, yeah. Here's Radical. That's David Platt. It's changing the way I look at things. I, actually, Tammy, you, you have one coming. I bought one for everybody in our department. Yeah, because it's just changed everything. Yeah, uh, Chris? Yeah, well, you don't thank me yet. You don't have it yet. <laughs> Yeah, I felt like there's some, you know, there's there's thought going on, and we need to have some more of this perspective. So, well, he's the head of the Southern Baptist Missionary Board now, and he was at a massive church in Alabama, and he got people people started selling their houses, literally, like the Bible says, and giving it to the poor and moving overseas and like. No, but it sounds really good. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> it's yeah. really good. It's basically, I mean, it's not a good It does talk about the, the really wealthy persons, yeah. but it's basically written for anyone who has money. Most of us, it's all right, it really. as Christians, yeah. what is our response to yeah. society, which, you know, after even in my... I'll leave that alone. <laughs> even even in my home based work, even in my home based work, I just feel like if the church could approach people differently, it'd be amazing. That's what I was wondering. Well, we wouldn't even. Christian Yeah, because we wouldn't even necessarily need half the Democrat agenda if the church just did its job. So. Um, yeah. the skate park yeah. well and like Platt well we're hoping Platt actually in his, in this he talks about at his church they decided they, they called the local well we have DHS like the foster and adoptive group I said how many foster parents do you need he said 150 it's, I mean there's like 10,000 people at this church 160 families signed up and so they took care of all the foster kids in the whole county I mean stuff like that so um I mean, politics, political stuff aside, like there was one that I didn't agree with morally and the other one I didn't agree with socially. You know what I mean? And so it's like, okay, what do I do? So um, we wouldn't need all that stuff. You just protect us and take care of the roads and we'll take care of the rest. Libertarian all of a sudden, right? So. Well, I'm, 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 I'm kind of a classic conservative politically, so. I had trouble with both of them. But anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really it. Yep. So, well, I'm sorry, but I'm not. It was so short, I guess. Well, no, no. I'm sorry that we only going to hear you. Yeah. Later, 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 later. yeah. yeah. Well, they didn't have that many before. Yeah. There were this morning, there was quite a few. But, um, yeah. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you. And Thank you. Yeah. If I haven't heard back from them yet, though, so it's either I'll either do a regular presentation or I'll do a poster. That's the way it works. They just they move you down the line. So I'll take either one. I like being there. It's a good it's a good conference. Well, because I don't know if you know like Gary Collins and Everett Worthington and um, Eric Johnson. Yeah, they're all there. It's a pretty massive thing in the psychology counseling world for Christians. So, because Gary Collins is the father of modern modern biblical counseling. And then Eric Johnson is doing the Christian psychology at Louisville Southern or Louisville Seminary, sorry. So, Mark Yarhouse, who writes. You mean to caps? Yeah. Eric Johnson said, "Come with me." I'm be like, "Yeah." Uh, they uh. And actually, another one at, at there, if you really care, Mark Garhouse, he writes a lot of stuff on gender dysphoria, gender identity stuff from Christian perspective. He does not compromise, but he's a really good way of approaching people. He's at Regent where I did mine. Mark Garhouse. There's one called uh, Understanding Gender Dysphoria and a one, another one called Understanding Sexual Identity. And he really walks a really nice line because he's still biblical, at least conservatively, right? And then, he, but he's, uh, he also has a really good relationship with those groups. He bridges a lot of gaps. So, yeah. I've been reading him. He's on my mind. So, anyway. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.